what we're going to be showing you is using infrastructure as code to scale across sites and teams, because it's not just the number of sites that you have, teams actually play into this, uh, how it gets built. So we'll show you GitOps with infrastructure as code, multi-site management, how that plays into team autonomy, because part of being a platform team, which is what we want to talk about, is, is making the teams that you're supporting work together. And of course, we will talk about security. So let me frame the demo. Uh, we've created a fictional bank called Bank N, or Bank N .cloud, um, and they've been a digital rebar customer since 2019. They started with some just basic bare metal regulatory compliance. They added more sites as they were successful with that, and they liked the software and how it improved. They've been able to start spinning up cloud infrastructure using our cloud capabilities, and now they're ready to add in a new team. They're formalizing the platform uh, approach by having a platform team. And that is going to allow them to take uh, their new crypto team, which has been working in AWS and Linode, and then extend that back into bare metal so that they can do some really real serious mining using, using the Texas grid. <laughs> so uh, with that said, I'm gonna launch into the demos and for the, for the people following along live, everything we're showing you is infrastructure as code. So we actually have a site, git.bankend.cloud, where the, 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 com the, the code that we're using to build the demo is actually stored and we'll be working out of that. So the first demo that we have running uh, is going to show you how we're scaling infrastructure as code across teams, literally bringing a new team into our systems using our GitOps. And that enables teams to be independent and autonomous. And we take advantage of our multi-site capabilities to actually give teams autonomy. We're gonna be role-playing this. I will be Rob Hirschfeld in the role-play. Uh, I am the chief of platform operations, a new hire who's come into the bank to help build the platform team. And I'm Greg Galtaus, uh, it's a bank. So I'm vice president <laughs> of platform architecture. Uh, I was the engineer who brought in Rackin Digital Rebar Platform to the, to the bank. And so um, Rob, what are we doing today? What's I What's Greg, I'm glad you asked because I have whiteboarded out a solution for us to bring on the new crypto team. Uh, I sat down, I read our docs, I know what's going on. So I've got the digital rebar manager here. I, I know we need to bring up a new site. So we're going to have to build a work order. And then, yeah. Um, so Rob, I, I've kind of got all this already automated so that we can just do this using our infrastructure as code platform. So why don't I just walk us through that? Okay. okay. So here's our digital rebar platform. These are our four existing DRP endpoints managed from our manager. Um, think of these as separate sites that are being controlled. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use our infrastructure as code platform and go and update our, um, well, I, I want it to be able to repeatable so people can see what I changed and how I did it. You said the crypto team? Crypto, yeah. All right, so we'll give them the three normal dev test environments. I seem to know. Oh, okay, so I can see what you're doing here. You've got, these are different uh, digital rebar sites, completely new sites, and then you're building one that is for the dev team, one for the test team, and one for the prod team, and that matches sites that we've already built. Oh, mm -hmm. okay, that's pretty straightforward. Then I'm gonna try and type to commit it. And then we'll tag it. So at that point, we have generated a set of triggers. So we have a set of webhooks that will call into our system notifying that the content in the Git repository was updated. It'll start going through and rebuilding that content, making it available. I can watch what it's doing from the set of tasks that are being put together. In this case, it's already built the content. Wait, up, so this is live? Mm -hmm. actually building These are the site. live tasks being run. At this point, it's rebuilding the catalog on the manager so it can be available to all the downstream DRP endpoints. And then once it's done, it's already scheduled something to go and trigger the system to go update the cluster. We use a cluster to represent all the machines that our endpoint is. And you can see it's already started running it. So at this point, Wait, these are whole new sites. Mm -hmm. Right. So at this point, we're using our resource brokers to go ask 
for some additional services to be brought and built up. In this case, we're going to use Linode to go spin up some new machines that will then be the basis for running our DRPM points, and those will be automatically installed using some pipelines we already built for deploying the, actually they come from rack in to deploy the server into the location. So wait, you're using digital rebar to install digital rebar, and then that's gonna connect in and build these sites for us? Yeah, so as the process goes forward, that's kind of getting built, and so we'll let that keep going. But I think- So I budgeted a week for this. How long is it actually gonna take? Less than an hour. And actually what I'm gonna do is also is, I think since we want to make them follow good practices, we're gonna set up a new repo for them so that they can have their own infrastructure as code area. So I'm gonna go in our, we use GitLab as our uh, repository. So I'm creating a public repo for them. Wait, so this, this team, the crypto team is actually gonna be, have their own, own repo. They're gonna be able to modify and change their own pieces? Yep. The whole aspect of this is that we can then help them manage their own set of requirements on whether they're going to be using Kubernetes or installing SXI or whatever they need to do. We're going to let them define those pipelines and let them manage that self in their own version path so that they can control it and then we can help inject things as they need it. So I'm a little confused because if they're building their own content pack, mm -hmm. right? They're going to have their own Git. It, it looks to me like if they come in, log into the UX, they're going to like step all over these other sites that we have. They get their own spaces. So once this content pack is done and built, I can generate it into location. So am I getting this right, that you're basically creating a namespace for the crypto team to have their own sandbox to play with whatever the resources are? We, we, that's exactly right. So because of the infrastructure as code capabilities of the product, everything the crypto needs is actually contained in a Git repository. Uh, in this case, they're, they're, we're building three digital rebar sites for them right now. And each one of those sites is going to have its own content. So from content perspective, the team is already pre-populated. Uh, what do you call them? Are they playbooks? What are, what are we call them content, content packs. packs. Content, well, so they, they're pre-packaged content packs for, mm -hmm. uh, they don't need to know the details of how you deploy ESXi or Kubernetes. They can just get grab a content pack and say, oh, I want to run, um, I want to run a system that's going to do some uh, blockchain validation and I just need the underlay and I want to do it on one. I don't want to do it on Kubernetes. I don't want to do it on ESXi. I just want to do it on some bare metal Linux OS. Yeah, so we'll have potential more ex examples of that here in a minute. But the idea is that the content pack is not necessarily all of that. It's just the customization of what they need on top of the existing pipelines mm -hmm. so that if it's deploying Linux, they can reuse the Linux part, but then add their application on top of it so that that application deployment gets added into that pipeline. So that when they ask for those systems, the reuse happens and then their application is running and then they can build additional kind of constructs on top of that using clusters and stuff like that to then say like, well, I actually want 20 machines having a distributed system. So I need two of them selected as controllers and those kind of stuff that kind of operation can be embedded into like the cluster system that we have. So if I'm thinking, if I'm putting this in like the context of cloud, this is, you know, I'm grabbing an AMI for the actual OS that's going to be, end up being in this instance, a bare metal thing. And then I can lay my application on top of that base image, or I can uh, create a pack that will re repeatedly lay my, my uh, additional content on top of that. So uh, obvious question becomes what happens when the platform group changes that 
pack, that underlying pack, how does that impact my day to day? Yeah, we can talk about that <laughs> in a couple of okay. so, minutes. And, but, but, but what you just Get described the is the problem statement that most enterprises are dealing with is they have no way, and this is what we saw 10 years ago when we started this journey, is every time we fixed automation and helped somebody improve, we had no way to take it backwards. And what we've done is designed to actually protect that use case where the teams have actually, we can actually have teams collaborating together with known points where they're working along a pipeline. It's, this is why we use the CICD pipeline analogy and it's so important is that in a CICD pipeline, you actually have teams that collaborate because they're connected together. They're not stepping on each other. They, they have known places to integrate. And this is exactly what we brought to infrastructure. Okay, so now, Rob, I have my servers coming up and I'll- Sorry, I have another question. Can, can you, I mean, in a non-traditional environment, let's say that I want to build a skunk works lab for instead of the crypto lab. Yeah. So, can I set up an environment and give them all the options uh, and they can you know, yeah, in rebuild fact, everything, everything? In fact, that's exactly that's what I was way. going to show. <laughs> so this, for example, is what the retail dev team, I've already built them, they're already up and running. So they have their own system and it's already built and they actually have a Kubernetes cluster that they're already running. So, so, so this, is, this is a completely different digital rebar? Yeah, this is a different rebar instance. Um, I've logged into it directly. The manager gets to see all of that because it's an aggregated system. So what we build is actually not a centralized control plane, but a federated chain. So all of the edge nodes are actually acting and doing the operations. No operations are happening back at the manager. So that gives really, you really good for MSPs, in other words. Mm -hmm. Well, and edge sites and distribution, and then you're not worrying about backhauling data and all sorts of other. But, but also for the Skunk Works team. So we can give somebody a completely dedicated environment where they can go crazy and, and then take all what they do, capture as infrastructure as code and share it. So like here, I can create a cluster. I'm just gonna create a temp cluster. Um, and I'm gonna, instead of using Linode, I'm gonna use a context broker. Brokers in our system are ways to ask for resources. So we can use cloud brokers like Linode or Amazon, Google. But in this case, I have a context broker is just gonna say, give me some containers. Can, can you make this like pink or orange or something for me? Now what's happening is the system is running a cluster pipeline that knows how to go ask the uh, broker for resources. And in this case, it's spinning up and going through a set of tasks to build that. And it's now going to, we get there, ask the broker over here to run an item on its behalf, which in this case is going to spin up a bunch of containers, which will show up here, which will start running pipelines that were defaulted in this case, just a what's in the container. And then that gives them the control and they can do this all from the UX, but there's also a full API and you can do this through your infrastructure's code, kind of get ops pipeline updates and stuff like that. Here we're not provisioning bare metal servers, we're provisioning containers. Correct. So these are provisioning containers running on the DRP endpoints to take action and such. Okay. So in this case, they are being synchronized by that cluster system and then running through the rest of the process. And then because we've given the controls, we can also clean them up. So I can say like, well, I'm done with this cluster, so I'm gonna delete it. So do you see a lot of that or do you see people like using you, your stuff to provision a, you know, a physical cluster that they, you know, that would, you know, you guys would lay on, you know, an open shift or something like that. And that would be the thing that would manage the containers. So you, you have yeah. like a delineation of responsibility. So a lot of times that's the usage because while we manage containers, those systems also have additional services and stuff they build yeah. on top of. So there's a use case for that. We use containers a lot of times for, and what we call contexts to drive things like, we need to be able to configure a switch that can't run an agent or do controls. So we're going to spin up a, a temporary container that knows how to configure the switch, but we still want to do workflow control against it. I was actually going to bring up that question later. Um, since you guys mentioned tower companies um, and 5G, uh, do you guys, I mean, is this possible that this platform could be extended or maybe it does today 
have the ability to kind of bare metal configure open switches? Oh, yes. Wow. The digital rebar platform is actually a, a self-contained binary effectively. Yeah. Uh, it's sufficiently lightweight that it could run in a switch or a smart switch. So in theory, you could choose to run it at an edge location, not necessarily in a IP traditional- CNFs, that's gonna be a great use case. Correct. Right, wow. and then it can handle managing the local devices as well. The, but The other thing I would point out about the, the, the way we use containers, which is very unique in market, and this comes back to how different tools get integrated into the system. When we build a workflow, we, our agent can run on the machines, what we would call on, on machine context, but you can also pull that back to run in a container context and you can run in multiple containers. So if we have a tool like a switch interface tool or Ansible or Terraform or VReal, some VMware tools, they have like six different ones you have to use. We can actually build a workflow that moves in and out of different tools by changing the context behind the scenes. And so when we build a workflow that has 20 different types of tools in it, we actually can integrate those all into an infrastructure as code pipeline. Um, and that's actually a lot of what you see happening here is us being able to move back and forth through that process uh, seamlessly. And the crypto team's not ready. Excellent. You can tell them well, that, that that's good. I might sit on this for a little while so they don't get used to this type of performance. Good idea. <laughs> you mentioned there about being able to roll out a data center in a week. You know, obviously that's a lot of servers. Uh, you must have some kind of mechanism to catalog all of this hardware. Is it DHCP boot? There's, we have, there's some capabilities where we actually get manifests before the machines even show up. And so, so you must be holding resource pools of available you know, clusters, servers, containers. We can. Everything. But you were able to spin up a new cluster or multiple new clusters there. In this case, like types. I said, we were using cloud resources to pull in a VM and then oh. start the process and go forward. We can do that also using a pool broker, which is what you're talking about. Okay. And then a lot of our use cases come from our bank friends who roll in whole racks with the expectation they plug in power and networking. And then our system automatically discovers it, classifies it and drives it to its end goal all in just one arrival. So no touch after just plugging it in. It through a DHCP pixie process. It also ver verifies that it matches mm, right. expectations. So one of the huge time savers in that whole process is that if something doesn't match the manifest, we stop and let them fix it. And that actually saves weeks of time by not trying to configure gear that isn't. The and then can it recheck that and resume? It continually uh -huh. rechecks yeah. it. Or it can, yeah. And we'll talk about some of that in a minute. Uh, and, and I assume given the fact you're using different tool sets, it, it, it's almost cloud agnostic. It is cloud agnostic. Yeah, yeah we've had. <laughs> there, yeah, it's, you, it's a, I, I was giving you a better wiggle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, well, I view it as we try and create places where the specific parts can be replaced. So like bringing up a virtual machine in Amazon is different than bringing it up in GCE. But once you have the virtual machine, right? All the rest of that should be similar. And all the before it should be similar if you're on physical, right? So the idea is that those are pluggable, changeable units. If you create the workflow to do it in that platform once that can be replicated any number. Correct, exactly. And the way our system works, you can inject things around for it. I'm obviously user available templates yeah uh, or a lot of that so i'm not sure what you mean by that per and se template workflows for yeah yeah, yeah. so our whole system is actually a dynamic rendering engine of which we provide some templates you could provide some templates and then those get rendered into tasks that can represent scripts and, okay. and that is demo three so and, okay. <laughs> and, and oh, i'll right. take a demo four next time <laughs> 